Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody. This is Howard Fox, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is Diane Gillespie. Diane is the author of Stories for Getting Back to Sleep. In this work, Diane uses her knowledge and understanding of stories to craft sleep scenarios designed to help people fall back to sleep in the middle of the night. Diane is an educational psychologist by training and an emerita professor of community psychology from the University of Washington, Bothell. She is also a volunteer and advocate for the nonprofit Toastan, whose vision and mission is to bring dignity for all and empower communities to develop and achieve their vision for the future and inspire large-scale movements leading to dignity for all. Diane, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Well, it's just a joy to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Diane, when I was introduced to you via LinkedIn, and I saw that your book, Getting Back to Sleep, I, I immediately thought about myself and my love of sleep. I swear, if I could make a living just by sleeping, that would be a perfect occupation. Having said that, I get to do a lot of other fun things like being on a podcast with folks just like you. So I would love in the time we have together, if you could share a little bit about your background and how you came to write this book, Getting Back to Sleep. Oh, I would be delighted to do that. So I slept pretty well until I was in my 50s. Occasionally, I had to count sheep. And then when I started to have trouble I went to a pharmacist. Now, this was 20 years ago. Okay. And you might remember at that time, there was a jingle on TV advertisements called Take Somonex Tonight, Safe and Restful, Sleep, Sleep, Sleep. Right. So I went to the pharmacist and I said, well, I'm having trouble sleeping. Do you recommend Somonex? And he said, oh, just take Benadryl. So I did. And it seemed to work. I didn't take it every night. I took it for about 10 years. It is what's called an anticholinergic. Now, many brands, it's not just Benadryl, have this ingredient in them, including the PM ones. And then when I started traveling internationally, I got a prescription for Ambien. And I didn't, again, take it all the time, but I found it really effective for getting back to sleep. But the Ambien prescription didn't last long. My doctor would no longer prescribe it. And actually, she explained that other people in her practice were no longer prescribing it. And about that time... Well, well, let me ask you stop for one second. So she was not prescribing it because there was an addiction or studies to the the negative... The big surprise for everybody came in 2015 when the adult changes in thought study actually was conducted by researchers at my own university and my own healthcare system was published. And I just want to quote from that study. Sure. Essentially, when the researchers examined medication use of 3,500 people over 65, They found that people who used anticholinergic drugs like Benadryl were more likely to have developed dementia than those who didn't use them. Moreover, dementia risk increased along with the cumulative dose. Taking an anticholinergic for the equivalent of three years or more was associated with a 54% higher dementia risk than taking the same dose for three months or less. Oh, my. Just two months ago, Howard, a new study from England with a larger sample size found that prescriptions for anticholinergic drugs increased dementia by 50%. Now, my mother died of Alzheimer's. Oh, wow. So this got my attention as you can imagine. Sure. So I started thinking, how am I going to be able to deal with my disrupted sleep without using medications? So I started telling myself stories when I would wake up in the middle of the night. And I also started looking at the stories I was telling myself. 
And the stories I was telling myself when I would wake up were ones of what I called desperation and woe. Oh my gosh, I'll never get back to sleep. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do tomorrow? I can't, won't be able to take a nap. So what I realized from my training as, as a psychologist is I really had to replace those stories of desperation and row. So I started thinking about alternative stories. And I was working in a writing group. And I told my writing group what I was doing in my head. And they said, would you write one of those stories up for us? And that was the beginning. I wrote one of them up. They loved it. And it was the beginning of the 16 stories that are now in the in the book, Stories for Getting Back to Sleep. That's very interesting. And what I find also extremely interesting is you are suffering, for the sake of a better word, or not having a comfortable full night's sleep and, and, and getting up. The, the negative side, the stories of woe, I mean, that what we know about neuroscience, and, and I'm not going to begin to tell an educational psychologist, Emerita <laughs> from University of Washington, Bothell, anything she doesn't already know. But I, what, what I do know is stories of woe, those stories have an effect on our brain and the chemical tra- and in different parts of the brain <laughs> versus other stories, which are perhaps more positive for the sake of a better word. And that does different things in our, in our brain. It does. Okay. So now you've, you, you were doing the, the writing in this writing group. What kind of writing group was it, by the way? It was whatever you wanted to write. You would bring three pages and people would react to it. And then you would take it back and revise it. I've been in writing groups for probably about 25 years. Oh, my. So it's really a way I have of testing out how my sentences go together and whether or not something's worth writing or not. One of the stories, for example, didn't work for the group, so I just let that one go. So, but yeah, writing groups can be really powerful as you're, especially in the beginning parts when you're beginning to write a longer piece. Sure. It's interesting is the writing groups have been a consistent theme for many of our guests on the podcast, especially the ones that are, are writing the, the fic works of fiction. And yes. because some of them are first time authors, they have this idea, this spark of inspiration, and they have somehow discovered the writing groups. But here you've been in a writing group for 20 some years was this during your 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 work at the universities doing your your scholarly work? Absolutely. Yes. In fact, I led writing groups for faculty for a period of time. Oh wow, okay. Yeah. So at the same time I was writing in the writing group and writing these stories, all of a sudden in the culture, people started writing about the importance of sleep. So Ariana Huffington published The Sleep Revolution, and her book is a cultural critique of the sort of workplace and its norms that mislead people <laughs> into no. thinking that they're actually good workers if they stay up working all night. Sort of the, the social norm is that if you really are loyal to your company, you will sacrifice your sleep. This isn't just in corporations, it's also in nonprofits. And so at the same time she's writing, people like Matthew Walker, who's a neuroscientist and sort of a sleep evangelical at Berkeley, wrote a book called Why We Sleep. By the way, that's just recently been criticized, but sleep was getting a lot of attention in publications and in popular science publications. And one of the things that was happening in both of books like theirs is that deprivation, sleep deprivation is harmful, but also medications are harmful. So then what happens is everybody turns to technology, right? <laughs> Right. So now you can get oh headbands to wear at night. You can get molecule sheets that keep you cool during the night. There's a light that you can emit 
that sort of supposedly, I mean, everybody, there are lots of testimonials to all of these products, right? Oh, I'm sure there are. And a dream pillow, which conducts music only you can hear through bone conduction. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the gravity blanket that you can use. So all of those are pretty pricey. They, yes. I mean, you, know, you can get a smart bed now. That Like your phone is smart, you can get a smart bed. Those might be useful to people, I think, because medication has been seen to be so dangerous, then if these technological devices work, that's certainly a better option than medication. But the number one method now embraced by the medical profession is what's called cognitive behavior therapy. And that's the, what my book participates in. And narrative psychology is a part of cognitive behavior therapy in that it looks at what you were saying, the constructive practices for better understanding and enriching our lives, sort of, and how the stories that we tell ourselves really do have an influence on our behavior. And what I've found is that for many people, stories like these can uh, improve their sleep. Sure. Both the duration and the quality. So I'm curious, having the, this, the sleep issue and having the background in educational psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy, and understanding narrative psychology, what was that aha moment for you? of no medication, no technology, because by the way, all that technology costs a lot of money and there's a lot of people selling it at 10 o'clock at night on the cable channels. So how did you make that aha? How did you get that aha moment? Like we need to go back to the drawing board of what I know better than anybody else of let's use stories and psychology to solve this. Well, I think the aha moment was, and I'm not sure I know it better than anybody else, but the aha moment was when people told me the stories were working, like they were working for me. I mean, the aha moment was when I would wake up in the morning and realize, oh, that story got me back to sleep. I have a blizzard story, for example, and I often go to that because it's something that that's a kind of atmosphere that often makes me go to sleep. And so it's sort of like this can work once people get the strategy down and it has the advantage. If you learn the stories, you don't have to turn a light on because light is the enemy of sleep, according to the National Sleep Foundation. And so these are things you carry in your head that you can kind of play like a, a movie in your, in your head in the middle of the night when you wake up. Okay. Now, in thinking about these stories, in the book, there are 16 stories. Mm -hmm. What are the, the subject matter? I mean, you mentioned the blizzard. I heard one of your YouTubes talked about the beach and the, the oil. <laughs> uh, I have to share with you, by the way, one of my favorite childhood memories, and this goes back to when I was probably in my preteens, when the we didn't have air conditioners, but in the summer the windows were open. There was a fan going, and probably three, four miles away there were train tracks, oh, and yes. the train whistle. I, I, I think the train whistle at night when it's quiet is is the most wonderful sound in the world. I agree, and I have a train story <sighs> with a That's train great. whistle because I had that same experience. Oh wow! Okay. And it's almost like I'm not at a place now where I can hear a train whistle, but it's almost like if I'm sleeping somewhere where there is one, I, it puts me right to sleep. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so the other stories, like I have spa stories, massage stories, rainy day stories, camping, a camping story. I have a, a river raft story. Someone wrote me about they loved, that they loved that story, put them to sleep. As soon as they got, I mean, get, you get to, when the, when you get used to the stories, you get you you can almost go to sleep as soon as you put your foot on the boat. <laughs> oh wow! So uh, I have a sleeping pod, and those are being put in workplaces. You can mm -hmm. get you can workplaces are putting in sleeping pods where you can get into a dark 
compartments and there's a bed and you can you can put on music you can put on sounds so I have a sleeping pod story I have a hammock story and then at the end I have this these sort of meditative pieces about kneading bread about snapping beans dripping honey just sort of met these are all sort of meditative practices that lead you very steadily into sleep okay now there's in each one of these stories there's there's certainly a lot of visualization and really activating the senses hope so a variety of the senses i'm curious is there are, are there steps involved as you, I don't want, I'm using the word consume, but take advantage and, and approach the, the story to help you. Are there steps involved for this? Yeah, that's a great question. So first, not all the stories work for all people. And I found that out right away. Like some people hate beaches. They don't want to, they don't relax on a beach. Other people can't wait to get to the beach lie in an umbrella and take a nap. Not everybody likes hammocks, for example. So what you have to do is read through the book, read through the stories, and they're not long, and find a story that you think will work for you. So that's the first step. And sometimes like there are three or four out of the 16 that'll work. Okay. So the next thing you have to do is you have to read the story and you have to edit out, you have to use it like a workbook. You edit out anything that I've written that might cause you anxiety. So, for example, the character in the beach uses baby oil because it's like 420 in the afternoon. And she doesn't mind getting out in the sun for 20 minutes with that on. But other people might not ever go anywhere without 50 sunscreen, right? Of course. So, you would just change the baby oil to sunscreen if you never wanted to get your skin in the sun. So... So those are the things that editing work is really important. So you use sort of what I've got as an example, but you make the story your own and you can add details, whatever works for you. But the key is, and the third step is, that you have to learn the sequence in the story because we know in the middle of the night, that if you don't have a kind of sequence of what's going to happen, these other bo- bothersome thoughts are going to intrude right. <laughs> into your brain. And so what the sequence does is it really keeps you hopefully in the environment that your body is really experiencing as much as possible physically. So, you know, like you really feel the sun on your, on your skin. Mm-hmm. You really feel the hammock gently rocking or the boat. You hear the water lapping against the boat. By the way, those are my two other favorite experiences. <laughs> I love, I have these fond memories of being up on uh, Grand Marais, up on the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, up in uh, the Upper Peninsula, Lake Superior, and just the sound of the water against the shore, and then the the rigging on sailboats. Yes, I mean I could I could be at the harbor in the morning and just hear the rigging, and I'm like, I'm just getting tired. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. Actually, what's really fun is when people start to write their own stories. Mm-hmm. And I always say, go to the place where you were just pulled down and where you're pulled down into sleep, where you can't stop it and use that experience as the basis for creating a scenario that leads you back into sleep. That's fantastic. Is there a story within the 16 or an excerpt of one of these stories that maybe you could gift us, you know, gift our audience? Because I would love just to hear a little bit about one of those stories. I think what I'll do is read one that's called A a Late Night Swim. Okay. It's a shorter story. And then what I'll do is at the end of each story, I have tips for how to use the stories. So we can talk about that. Sure. 
Sheila worked a long day at her volunteer job in the office in Dakar, Senegal. Coming home late, she had gone for a long swim in the ocean and had a sumptuous dinner. The famous Senegalese cheb or chebajin, a spicy vegetable rice and fish dish. When she returned to her room, sweating and tired, she turned on the air conditioner. The day's events swirled through her head. She found herself problem solving, thinking about what she would say the next day. She knew, however, that she needed to stop worrying and let the day's work drift out to sea. She was exhausted, still catching up with jet lag, and if she didn't get to sleep, she would be useless at the office tomorrow. Sheila slowly takes down the mosquito net and watches it fall like a silky nightgown around the mattress. As she crawls under the net, she feels the cool air from the air conditioner, its noise providing the background monotony she needs to relax. Leaning back into the pillows, she imagines herself walking out across warm, smooth sand into the ocean and its tide. She dives into the cool water and then floats on her back, letting her body undulate with the movement of waves. Her arms and legs hang loosely Buoyed up by the water, she feels the tension from the day leave her body. The sun is setting and she inhales the salt air. As she feels her body lying on the bed, she notices that her arms and legs are lighter, as if she they are being held up by water. She imagines the waves rocking her up and down. Imagining the emotion calms her. She pulls the soft sheet up around her neck and drops off to sleep. Wow. So the book is also an audible form. Okay. Because audiences would say, would you please do Audible? <laughs> yes, that's, that's good. A good thing I have Audible credits because, which actually that begs another question. It, I would imagine this, the, the book is perfect for both men and women. Doesn't matter what age, but yeah, because I think this met the meditation, the calming down from a busy day, everybody, heaven knows I could use that because I, my life is 24 by seven. So the audible, I think, makes perfect sense. And I, I, I think some of those stories, and I think the, 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 the craftiness of it, of, of building your own story, I think is wonderful too. It is. Just make your story your own. Right. And so for this story, probably one of the strongest tips I wrote has to do with this story. And what I, when I was working in all of the, what's available for it, for insomnia, what I found is that there wasn't a lot for women actually. And so all of the stories are told from a, have a female character, but men have told me that they work for them as well. Uh, although sometimes they tell different stories like playing eighth grade baseball. Okay. Is what puts them to sleep. But I think this story has a mosquito net in it. And that it's a, it can be a metaphor for a dividing line between the worries from one's daily life mm -hmm. and a special worry-free space for sleep. And I, what I say is before the stories really can work, you really have to understand how self-care 
in this case, getting adequate sleep is a prerequisite for effectively caring for others. Mm -hmm. So once one recognizes that we are worthy of, and you have the right to the safe space, the more the space can nurture and be a source of quietude for you. And so I like to think about the mosquito net often because it's like you keep the mosquitoes that are going to zap you outside the net. And I, fi I find when, when women talk to me about when they wake up, what they're worried about are is their caretaking of other people, not all, but, but a lot. And so I think you, you really have to, that's one of the tips is you really have to make your bed a place for nurturance for yourself because that's the basis of good caretaking. We don't really need science to tell us how badly we feel the next day when we haven't gotten seven to nine hours of sleep at night. A couple of questions on the book is, once I have the book and I am working with it, what are the, how long, one question is, how long does it take to begin to feel something different and maybe that's per, that's a kind of a naive question because everybody is going to be different the other question that was going through my mind is what are some of your friends colleagues the writing group what are they saying after taking the book or the audio version and, and beginning to use this what's been the reaction to it that's a really great question i think people who have a meditative practice find the stories most useful. And that is because they have a system for calming their mind already. And in fact, I recommend that people just do a body scan, what's called a body scan, where you make your feet relax all the way up to the top of your head. And then go into the stories. That's especially if you wake up suddenly in the middle of the night and you're having difficulty getting back to sleep. The other strategy I tell people is that when you wake up, and usually it's to go to the bathroom, what you do when you get out of bed is you get right into the story without even thinking. You just go right into that hotel room in the story that I just read to you. And you turn on the air conditioner and you hear that ambient, you know, you hear the white noise of the air conditioner. And you, right as you're walking into the restroom and then as you come back out, so that when you get back into bed, you're really full of quiet. Mm -hmm. So... That's another strategy. People who don't have meditative practices, I think, have to practice the strategy more. Okay. It's not a pill. And that's my, you know, that's the problem is it's easy to pop a pill. Well, hopefully they'll do their homework. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so I think if, and, and for me, even sometimes I'll start in the hammock and then I'm still not asleep. So I go to the cabin in the woods. You can go from story to story and you can create your own new stories. But I think it's the ritual in the long run that is going to be what works. The other thing is to do what the National Sleep Foundation recommends. And that is to avoid artificial light at least an hour before you go to bed, to sleep in a totally darkened room, to keep your bedroom at between 60 and 66 degrees. Exercising during the day really helps. I tell people when you come back from a five hour hike, you just fall asleep because you're exhausted. Right. Not to avoid heavy meals and alcohol before bedtime. And then what people are really emphasizing are keeping the same sleep hours. Right. So go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time regardless. Good. Good. Fantastic. I mean, this is fascinating and love the use of the stories. And I mean, like I shared earlier, there's a couple of stories. I mean, the sound of the train is just just totally relaxes me. And I can, luckily, even in the winter, I could still hear it through the blinds and the, and the closed windows. Now, 
there's really something special going on with this book. And now that you are retired from the university, you're involved in some uh, nonprofit volunteering and advocacy. And, and I, I know there's some connection back to this book as well. And I was hoping you could share a little bit about that. Oh, thank you so much. So I'm a volunteer for this just amazing organization called Tostan in West Africa. It's actually been the focus of Melinda Gates' new book, The Moment of Lift, and, and Hillary Clinton and Chelsea's new book. So it's getting attention I think it deserves. So Tostan ha- is a non-formal, three-year, human rights-based program that works with really the poorest of the poor across West Africa to give them the skills and abilities to allow them to do their own community development. It's a form of community-led development. They have lots of experience in creating new forms of being in their communities given the information that Protostan provides in a curriculum. And that curriculum is really co-produced by the communities themselves. So it is well known because it has ended, the communities have decided on their own to end the practices of child marriage and female genital cutting. Okay. And what struck me really when I was writing the sleep stories and people said, well, why don't you create a book? because we struggle with sleep so much in this country. You know, it's called an epidemic now. Right. The sleep deprivation is really an epidemic in our country. And so we know for well-being that we have to have adequate sleep. And here are these communities that are creating well-being, doing very brave things in their their communities. So I thought, oh, well, this will be a fundraiser for Tostan. So we have well-being for people reading the book and hopefully well-being in the workplaces that they go into with that book to encourage people to change the norms around what it means to be loyal by not sleeping. Okay. And increasing the well-being of especially women and girls in West Africa. So that part's been really a joy. And I have been able, the book has made enough money that I have been able to make a pretty sizable contribution to Toast Time. Oh, fantastic. Congratulations on that. If your listeners know people who have sleep issues, please tell them, you know, I hope they recommend the book because it's hard when you're doing a fundraiser to do the, pay for the publicity, obviously. Well, we, we will do our part as we promote the podcast as well. And in the show notes, we'll have links back to the Toast On website as well as to the book's website. And we'll put some content in the show notes that the proceeds from the book, you know, whether you, wherever you buy it from, that a portion of that goes, is going directly to Toast On. So all of the, all of the profits go to Toast On. All the, all the profits. Yes. I was actually thinking that public Amazon takes the oh, portion of it, with, it. <laughs> <laughs> but I get it. I get it. You're right. But no, that that's wonderful. And it's, it's a way to just keep on giving. And we certainly are uh, very thankful you taking time out of your day to share with us about your work, the book, and, and also about Toast On itself and the work you're, you're doing there too. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, yes. I'm probably the only author you've had who, if I put some of your listeners to sleep, will be greatly honored. Well, I, I mean, you, you, you reminded <laughs> me of certain aspects. I mean, again, like I say, I love sleeping. If I could do it as a profession, I would do it. But it, it reminded me of how much I would feel bad if I was not near the train tracks. I mean, the, I, I have the, the L tracks in Chicago, but then we have some freight trains that go by. And it's that freight train that just, I, I, I couldn't imagine not being near it. So it, when I was reading the notes about you and the book, and that's what came to mind. And yeah, I wonder if there's a, tra- a book on tra- a story about the trains. You have it. That's the compliment I can get. 
<laughs> Fantastic. So, Diane, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where's the best place for them to go? On my website, which is D I A N E M G I L L E S P I E dot com. Excellent. So, Diane M. Gillespie dot com. M. Gillespie. Mm hmm. Perfect. And we'll also provide a link back to LinkedIn and also to Toast On as well for our listeners. Great. Thank you. All right, everybody. We've just been chatting with Diane Gillespie. She's the author of Stories for Getting Back to Sleep. In this work, again, she uses her knowledge and understanding of stories to craft sleep scenarios designed to help people fall back to sleep in the middle of the night and do check out the book, whether it is the power to paperback version or the audible version. I'm probably going to do the audible version of the audio version. And also do check out the organization that Diane is volunteering and is an advocate for the nonprofit toast on who are doing some phenomenal work in West Africa. Again, we'll provide all the links back to those sites on our show notes. And hey, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. And when you get home and you get ready to go to sleep, have a good night's sleep and start thinking about those stories that make to help you sleep all night. So we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com. 